Hello and welcome to another Sunday Bible study, or at least another Bible study that I normally get posted by Saturday afternoon for Sunday morning, and which some of you see Sunday morning, some of you see Saturday, and, and some of you see it some other time during the week. Whatever time you choose to join us, I just want you to know that I am honored and I'm pleased and, and flattered that you've taken time out of your busy schedule to spend some time with the rest of us looking into the words of the Savior, looking into the activities of Jesus Christ while he was here on this earth. Our lesson material comes from the Gospel Project, and we have studied over the past nearly two years now uh, the Old Testament. Now we're in the New Testament. We're talking about the ministry of Jesus, and in the weeks and months to come, we will continue talking about the efforts of Jesus and then the efforts of his uh, disciples, his apostles, and the followers of Jesus as we work through from uh, Acts to Revelation. If you have been with us the last few weeks, you know that we have talked about incidents in the life of Jesus that dealt with, at least in part, water. We looked at the ministry of Jesus in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John, where Jesus met a, a woman of the well, and he told her about living water a term that she didn't understand at the time, but a term that Jesus explained us as this in John 4:14. 4, Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. And we talked of another incident, this time in chapter 5 of John's Gospel, where Jesus meets a man at the pool at Bethesda, and this was a man who had been crippled for 38 years. And he was there at the pool trying to get into the pool that he might be healed. He had faith that he could be healed. He just couldn't get to the pool in time. Jesus comes along and tells him, take up your mat and walk. And the man does. He takes, he did just that. And, and when the man discovered it was, was Jesus that had healed him, he told everybody, including the Pharisees. And when the Pharisees realized that Jesus had healed the man, they also realized that he had healed the man on the Sabbath day, and thus breaking the law of Moses according to, to their interpretation. And they sought to take away the life of Jesus, to accept the fact that, that Jesus had healed this man was a threat to the Pharisees, because the Pharisees if Jesus was indeed the king that people claimed he would be when he was foretold, were in a position of importance, a position of, of strength, a position of authority, a position that if Jesus was indeed the king and people started to follow him, they would be threatened. Now, following those, those two incidents, Jesus walks on water, and that's a, an incident we're scheduled to look at in more detail in August. And, and following that, shortly after, according to John's Gospel, and that's the thing we're going to talk about today, Jesus meets another man. And, and this time he meets a man that was born blind. And, and Jesus, again, turns to, to water to help perform the miracle of giving this man uh, sight. But before he does that, before he actually heals the man, Jesus is able to teach his disciples a very important lesson, a lesson about affliction, a lesson about sin. When, when biblical scholars want to find the, the definition of a term used in the Bible or a word used in the Bible when they want an explanation, they turn to one of two sources. One of them is Strong's Concordance. This was published in 1890 by Professor James Strong of Drew Theological Seminary. And the concordance is an index of every single word that's found in the King James Version of the Bible. Now, the Greek word, translated as sin in the Bible, is found in Strong's Concordance under the, uh, the uh, notation G264 or G266. And it defines sin as properly missing the mark, or so as not to share in the prize, uh, as figuratively, or to, to err, especially morally, to sin. Now, in addition to Strong's Concordance, there's another book known as Thayer's Index. And Thayer's Index, uh, Joseph Henry Thayer was a professor of, of sacred literature at Andover Theological Seminary. 
He spent nearly three decades categorizing, uh, describing, and defining about 5,000 words that are found in the Old and New Testament, and also some words that are extra biblical. So together with the two of them, we're able to, to look at the definitions of what sin is, in their opinion, uh, and the definitions that most of us use today, and they give us a, a pretty complete definition of what sin is. To strong and sayer, thin is to be without a share in, or to miss the mark, to err or be mistaken, to uh, miss or wander from the path of, of uprightness and honor, to do wrong or to go wrong. It's to wander from the law of God, to, to violate God's laws. Now, that's their definition, but we have to look and see where, where did sin begin? Where did sin get its origin? Well, biblically, sin begins in the third chapter of the Bible, the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 6, where it reads like this. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Now that was the, the original sin. And later in Exodus, when Moses receives the uh, Ten Commandments from God, God speaks, and in Exodus uh, 20, verse 5, he says this, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Now, depending on your biblical translation, whichever version you use, the word sin appears about 450 times in the Bible. So it shouldn't surprise us to learn that the majority of people in both Old and New Testament times thought that a, a person's afflictions were based upon sins that they had committed or perhaps the sins of their parents or sins that some family member had committed. Even today, we still hear people when they suffer some sort of, of misfortune say something in the effect, what did I do to deserve this, what, whatever this is? And, and I, I question all of this sinning for a reason. And, and the reason is the opening two verses of the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John, the, the disciple that Jesus loved, the one who, who wrote his gospel from the standpoint of an eyewitness of the ministry of the Savior. If you're in my regular Sunday school class at First Baptist Church of Lexington, Missouri, I'd invite you to turn to page 39 in your daily discussion guides. For the rest of you in your own Bibles, I'd like you to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter nine, and we'll begin with verses one and two. It doesn't matter which version of the Bible you use. I recognize that, that some of you uh, have translations that differ from mine. I like to quote from the, the New King James Version because I like the, the poetry, the wording, the, the old English archaicness, if you will, of the King James Bible. But sometimes that's a little hard to read. It's a little hard to understand, even for someone like myself who, who claims to be English by birth. Uh, so if you take the New King James translation and adds a little more modern wording to it, it's a lot easier to understand, a lot easier to follow. And there are dozens upon dozens of translations, and they all differ a little bit. They are all the same in one thing. The message of God, the message of Christ, remains the same. And, and that's what we want to look at. So let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Jesus and his disciples are walking. And as they're walking, the verse tells us this, As Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born bl blind? Now, the question the disciples were asking reflected the, the common thought that a baby, while still in the womb, could commit some kind of sin that would be afflicting him when he was born, or that the parents could commit some kind of sin that would afflict the baby when he was born. Jesus knew better, and he rejected both questions concerning the sin of the baby or the sin of the parents, 
And he answered them in verse 3 by saying this, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now, Jesus continued his answer with a statement that, surprisingly, the, the, the disciples didn't question. I, I think if I had been there, I, I would have wanted Jesus to explain exactly what he meant when he said in verses 4 and 5, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, I've already told you that today's discussion and lesson deals with, with another water story. But there's, there's another story here that I want to look at for a few minutes. Uh, it's the, the healing of the blind man is another reason for people to accept that Jesus was the Son of God, another reason for people to believe that he came with power, with authority, with the ability to, to cause miracles to take place. But before we actually get to that, I want to take a quick look at this other story. And, and this other story deals with the last part of the scripture we've just read. Specifically, the last seven words of John chapter 9, verse 5. In fact, not only all seven words, only two words of those last seven. The two words that say, I am. You see, Jesus makes seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. And we're going to look at those probably in detail at a later time. But for right now, Let's just list the seven in the order in which they appear. Uh, the first one, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He follows that by saying the one we just said, I am the light of the world. And then I am the door of the sheep. Followed with, I am the resur I am the good shepherd. And then I am the resurrection and the life, then I am the way, the truth, and the life, and finally, I am the true vine. Now, it's not those seven statements themselves that I want to focus on at this time, but rather the two opening words, I am. If you recall, God himself used those words when he asked Moses, to go back to the land of Egypt and free his people. Moses asked God in Exodus 3.13, Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God answered in Exodus 3.14, I am who I am. This was God's way of identifying himself by name. I am. All of Israel knew the term I am. All of Israel revered the term I am. All of the lawmakers, the Pharisees, knew the term I am. Even Herod, uh, granted the title of King of Judea by the, the Roman authorities, knew who Jesus was, who Jesus had been foretold to be. And when he confronted Jesus, and, and if you're familiar with the, the movie or the musical Jesus Christ Superstar, you may have heard my, my favorite line of the entire production, and, and you may have missed the significance of it. When, when Herod confronts Jesus, he asks him at one point, are you Jesus Christ? And Jesus answers with what I consider to be probably the, the greatest understatement of all times. He turns to Herod and he says, It's you who say, I am. And when Jesus, this, this newcomer from Nazareth, this, this upstart, when he showed up and, and claimed to be the Son of God by having the, the audacity, the temerity, the blasphemy, to lay claim to the title, I am, it, it simply infuriated the Pharisees even more. It, it added to their desire to see Jesus removed from their presence, from the presence of, 
the Israelites from the presence of the, the kingdom of Israel itself, if that was possible. In fact, the, the Gospel of Matthew uh, in chapter 12, verse 14, tells us this. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Jesus was indeed a, a threat to the Pharisees, uh, particularly to the way they controlled the people. They had the, the supposed authority to set laws and to interpret the laws of Moses the way they saw fit. And if this newcomer, this, this Jesus of Nazareth, this Savior, this Son of God, was who he was foretold to be, if he was indeed king, and the people rose up behind him and followed him, the Pharisees would lose their power. The Pharisees would lose their ability to control the people, uh, uh, an ability that had been given to them by the Roman Empire. As long as the Pharisees kept the people under control, the Romans pretty much left them alone. But if a new man came along, if a, if a king came along and started gathering vast multitudes of followers, the Roman Empire would come and they would crush Israel. And along that line, they would, they would crush the Pharisees. So the Pharisees were threatened by the presence of Jesus. And it doesn't surprise us that they were looking for a way to end his ministry. But it was not yet time for Jesus' ministry to end. He kept preaching, he kept teaching, and he kept healing. Now if you recall, we, we left Jesus with the man a few minutes ago saying this. He says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. That was uh, John chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. Verse 6 follows with this. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and mixed clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, during those times, mixing clay and saliva was, was basically a common practice for eye ailments. Uh, so Jesus wasn't doing anything unusual there. But Jesus may have used this common practice to give the man an opportunity to exercise his faith by doing what Jesus told him to do next. And Jesus commanded him in verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 7, He said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated as sent, so he went, and he washed, and he came back seeing. Now, there, there's an entire message in that word sent, if we wanted to take the time to look at it. And perhaps someday we'll get a chance to do that. The man was sent to the pool. Jesus was sent to the people. The water itself was actually sent to the pool from the spring of Gihon outside the walls of the city of David, through a tunnel 1,750 feet long to the pool itself. Uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of uh, wording that needs to be kind of discussed around that word sent. The pool itself was, was discovered in uh, 2004. And that, uh, well, the, the, whole, the whole story is, is uh, one for another time, actually. But when... Uh, when the man went to the pool and washed the clay off his eyes and was able to come back seeing, his friends, his family, all of those who knew him were astounded that a man who had been born blind could now see. They, they didn't understand what had happened. And, and once they had recovered enough to accept that it was truly him and that he could truly see, they sought out the man who had done the healing. They sought out this man, Jesus. Once again, and to the Pharisees. When they were confronted with the once blind man who could now see, they weren't astounded. They weren't amazed. They weren't anything but angry. They sought out the man's parents to assure themselves that, that this was actually their son. They didn't want to believe it. They thought someone was trying to, to put something over on them. And so they confronted the man's parents in John 9, 19, and they asked them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see now? Now, you have to understand that the, the parents feared the Pharisees. They feared their power. If they admitted that they believed the healer was indeed the Christ, 
the Pharisees would forever put them out of the synagogue, a, a term that we would call excommunication from the church today. To, to add to their fear, their son had been healed on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees had strictly forbidden anyone to work on the Sabbath. And healing was work. Even if it was healing by some miraculous power, even if it was healing through the, the power of God. The parents' fear kept them from telling the Pharisees they believed that Jesus was indeed the Christ. And they referred the questioners back to their son, who had already talked to him. So they questioned the son for a second time. And in John uh, 9, 26, they, they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Now, he, he hesitated to, to tell them uh, again, because he was not sure what their motives were, what they were trying to, to accomplish here. But he answered them this way in, the, in 927. He answered them and said, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples? Now, that reply was pretty bold when the man gave it to the Pharisees. But they couldn't deny that a miracle had taken place. They chose instead to attack the man's statement by referring to, to their source, to the source of their own supposed authority. In 927, they say, uh, then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple. We are Moses' disciples. Now, if you're in my regular Sunday school class, I want you to go to page 40, uh, because it's there in verse 29 that the Pharisees continue. Um, and they say this, we know God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he's from. Now, the man recognized that the, the Pharisees were the, <clears throat> excuse me, the social, political, and, and religious leaders of the Israelite nation. But in that knowledge, he was also somewhat astonished. And the man answered in verse 30, the man answered and said to them, why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from. Yet he has opened my eyes. Now, to me, it almost sounds like the man is, is sarcastically goading the Pharisees. And if there was ever any doubt about that, look at the next comment he makes, verse 31. Now, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. But the man doesn't stop there. With the crowd looking on, he continues to taunt the lack of knowledge and the lack of understanding of the Pharisees. Verse 32, since the world began, it's been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. And then the man goes ahead and delivers what I think was the, the final blow to the, the power of the Pharisees, to the standing of the Pharisees, the comment that made them lose face and prestige in front of the crowd that was there. The man says this, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Now, what do you suppose the Pharisees did then in retribution? The only power they had was the power of excommunication. In verse 34, they answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins and you were teaching us and they cast him out. For the Pharisees, the greatest punishment they could assign, the only way they could save face, the only real power they had was to excommunicate the man, to throw him out of the synagogue. And the story could end there, but it doesn't. Page 41 for my Sunday school class, for the rest of us, John chapter nine, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to the man, do you believe in the Son of God? Now, recall at, at the beginning of this, the examination of this story, the man who was healed was calling Jesus a man. That was verse 11. In verse 17, he called Jesus a prophet when the Pharisees questioned him the first time. And then when Jesus 
asked him if he believed, he answered this way. He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. From a man to a prophet, to Lord, to the realization that he stood face to face with the Son of God. What a, a change can be made with, with just a little bit of faith. What a change can come about by opening one's eyes. What a change can come about when one begins to realize who Jesus is. And then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. But what of the Pharisees? What was their reaction? They were evidently there. They heard the comment that Jesus made next. And the comment was this, verse 39. For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. The Pharisees heard. They heard who he who was speaking. And they knew. They knew who he was, even if they weren't willing to admit their knowledge. They knew, and because they didn't fully understand what Jesus was saying, because they didn't fully understand his statement, they had to ask. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words, and they said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus gave them an answer that, that we all know, that we probably all heard, perhaps even just in our own minds, when we claimed we didn't know, or it really didn't matter, or that no one will ever know what we did. When we feel we're without a share, going back to our definitions, when we feel we're without a share in our behavior, when we feel we exhibit behavior that misses the mark, when, when we claim to have erred or or been mistaken, when we feel we have missed or wandered from the path of uprighteousness and honor, when we have chosen to do or go wrong, when we have wandered from the law of God, when we have violated God's law, we were in the same position the Pharisees are in. And Jesus said to them in verse 41, If you were blind, you have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore, your sin remains. From man to prophet to Lord to the realization of the Son of God. It's, it's a path we all have taken in becoming Christians. None of us were born knowing who, who Jesus Christ was. We were told. Some of us had to be told many times. Some of us experienced miracles that brought us to worship the Savior. Some of us experience miracles that keep us there. Yet, there are countless thousands who, who don't have that knowledge or who don't know who provided their miracles because they've never been told. They go through life looking at, at things that happen as being pure circumstances, as, as pure serendipity, as, as a matter of being in the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time. And they never fully understand that it's Jesus Christ, the one who loves everybody, who's looking out for them at all times. So, what do we do? What are we supposed to do? Well, you and I, who are Christians, remember the final words, the final commandment that Jesus gave when he left this earth, waiting for the time that he would return again. That command was to go to everyone, make disciples of them, teach them his word, baptize them in his name. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And it's not easy. It's hard. Some of us look at that and say, well, I, I don't know who to talk to. And yet every week we run across somebody who, who simply doesn't understand. Somebody who maybe has never heard of Jesus or having heard, never quite fully comprehended the, the miracles or the parables or the stories of Jesus. Never quite understood why God loved the world enough that they, he could send his only begotten son so that the rest of us could live forever sin-free with him in heaven. Our job is to tell those people. Now, I know what you're saying. Well, I, I don't have the knowledge. I, I don't have the, the information. 
That's why we meet on a Sunday morning or whenever you look at this lesson, to learn a little bit more about the Savior, to learn perhaps another story, to learn a little bit more of, of something that happened in the ministry of Jesus that we can use to explain to somebody. We may never know the whole story. We may never know the scriptures. We may never be able to quote chapter and verse, but you know what you know, and it's enough. It's time for you to have the conversation. You don't have to stand on a, a street corner and, and preach to thousands or hundreds or dozens. You, you don't have to convert hundreds of people or baptize dozens. You simply have to talk to one. And in, if in talking to that one, you're able to move them just one step closer to Jesus Christ, God in his time will take care of the rest. Because you see, once a person hears, once he starts to understand, his curiosity will get the best of him. And perhaps he'll ask another and another and another. And eventually, he'll come to the point where God will be able to reach out and take his hand that'll be waiting for him and, and bring him into the fold, bring him into the family of Jesus. That's how it happened for each and every one of us. That's how it has to happen for those who are waiting still. But it's up to us. It's up to you. It's up to me. We, we don't really have a choice. When we accepted the, the title of Christian, when we accepted the, the gift of grace, the gift of forgiveness, we accepted the responsibility that goes along with it. And the responsibility is to have that conversation with somebody who doesn't know, to have that conversation in the name of Jesus Christ. I, I hope you'll take time to, to look at what we discussed today, to think about the things that we discussed today, and to look at your circle of friends, to look at the people that you work with, the people you uh, talk to, the people who are related to you, perhaps people that are family, and be able to say to them, I have a story to tell you. I want you to listen because it's great. It's the reason I'm a Christian and I want you to know why. I want you to know about my friend, my Savior, my Lord, Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me, please? Our dear Father in heaven, we bow our heads before you again this morning after looking into your book, after looking into the words that were saved for us for thousands of years. And we marvel, Father, that even in what seems to be a simple story, there's a message for us today, a message that allows us to talk to others, a message that allows us to, to tell others just who it is that is responsible for their being saved, whether they're aware of it or not. Just who it is that's responsible for the miracles they've experienced in their lives, whether they're aware of it or not. For Father, we recognize that we know who it is. We know who it is that performs the miracles. We know who it is that gave us grace. We know who it is that gives us mercy. We know who it is that has compassion on us. We just ask, Father, that, that you might be able to use us in service to our fellow man. Bless us that we might be able to move even just one, a step closer to you, a step closer enough that they might be able to reach out their hand and find you waiting for them as you once did for each and every one of us. We thank you, Father, for all the gifts that you've given us of yesterday, those you hold in store for today, and those to be revealed yet in the morals to come. We thank you most particularly for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's his, in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks again for, for being part of of a ministry that's a little bit unusual for me, but a ministry that I truly enjoy. Uh, I long for the time when I can once again meet in person with my regular Sunday school class at First Baptist Church of Lexington. When that time comes, if you're close to that church and want to come and, and worship with us, we, we'd love to have you there. In the meantime, please talk to your friends, uh, show them this video if you wish, show them some of the videos from past weeks, let them know who Jesus Christ is. Let them know why you worship Jesus Christ. Let them know why you think he is indeed the Savior. If you need help, I'm only a phone call away. I'm only a, uh, you can look on my Facebook page and find my phone number. You can find my uh, email address. I'd be happy to help. If you're talking to a person who's questioning and they're close and, and you don't feel like you have all the information you need to know, bring them to me. If I can't answer the questions for them, I'll be sure to find someone who can. Until next week then, 
until we meet again, may God's grace and mercy be ever upon you, and may you rest in the peace of an assurance that Jesus is with you always, that he loves you and cares for you. Thanks for being with us. Goodbye.